Welcome to The Mockingcast, the podcast of Mockingbird Ministries. I'm David Zoll, your host, and in just a few moments, I'll be joined by my co-hosts, Sarah Condon and R.J. Heyman. We come to you every other Friday to explore a few of the places where we currently see grace and its absence playing out in unexpected and compelling ways. We're glad to have you with us. Praise the Lord. February to the two of you. What uh, what is shaken on the hill uh, in Houston town? What's going on? The hill. <laughs> we there's, don't there, have hills. There's here. not a hill anywhere <laughs> near here. Literally I was every quoting, time we, uh, Nick we, we drive to Austin, we get about an hour and a half outside of town, and my kids are like, "There's a hill! Oh my god!" <laughs> like that's not. This is like the flattest place on planet Earth. It's not, maybe the Netherlands. Oh, good. Well, yeah. I stand. I stand good corrected. Yeah. I stand corrected. You do. Things are good in Houston, right? Well, guys, there's uh, been zero happening in Virginia, sort of on the national <laughs> oh, yeah, scale. Exactly. <laughs> Just kidding. This is the week the where Commonwealth uh, is fraying. Someone told, said, "Like, congratulations, Virginia, on your new uh, role as Florida." That's right. You're so the new Florida. Funny. That's right. We're, that's, I thought was kind of mean about Florida, where my folks oh, live. Oh well, but we can be mean hmm. about Florida. Huh. Yes, I think it's it's safe. <laughs> Today we are going into the cruelty of call-out culture, sort of a, a very timely thing, especially not just for Virginians, but for everyone. And this is a, a column written by David Brooks a uh, gotcha. few weeks ago, in fact. And he, what he really is talking about is this unbelievable episode of Invisibilia, the podcast that we talk about so much, um, that uh, was from their last season, I think, and it's about the punk rock culture in Richmond, I believe. And Again, it's about Virginia. A, uh, yeah, Virginia. All roads lead... <laughs> Uh, mm. Back to the Commonwealth, Mr. Uh, Jefferson this is, State. This is not. None of these are good roads at this point. But this is. Uh, it's about uh, a, a young woman calls out her friend for sending some sort of uh, to, for sexting someone in an unwelcome way, and she sort of uh, ruins his band, and then she starts a band, and um, it comes out that she had. Um, written a sort of a laughing emoji about a, 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 I think, a nude picture of one of her friends when she was younger. Anyway, this comes out, and she is, she is called out, and then overnight, um, her band is, which was sort of her whole life, is taken from her, and she's her sort of destroyed. So the same thing happens to her that happened that she sort of engineered with this guy. And this is where we pick up what Brooke says. Um, she says, uh, like, this is everything to me, and it's all just, like, done and over. The guy who called out Emily is named Herbert. He told Invisibilia that calling her out gave him a rush of pleasure, like an orgasm. So gross. Was, <laughs> this is the Keep New going. York Times. He was, he was <laughs> asked if he cared about the pain Emily endured. <clears throat> no, I don't care, he replied. I don't care because it's obviously something you deserve and it's something that's been coming. I literally do not care about what happens to you after the situation. I don't care if she's dead, alive, whatever. When the interviewer, Hannah Rosin, uh, showed skepticism, he revealed that he too was a victim. His father beat him throughout his childhood. Now, here's Brooks speaking. He says, in this small story, we see something of the maladies that shape our brutal cultural moment. You see how zealotry is often fueled by people working out their psychological wounds. You see that when denunciation is done through social media, you can destroy people without even knowing them. There's no personal connection that allows apology and forgiveness. You also see how once you adopt a binary tribal mentality, us, them, punk, non-punk, victim, abuser, you've immediately depersonalized everything. You've reduced complex human beings to simple good versus evil. You've eliminated any sense of proportion. Suddenly, there's no distinction between R. Kelly and a high school girl sending a mean emoji. Do we really think cycles of cruelty do more to advance civilization than cycles of wisdom and empathy? I'd say we no longer gather in coliseums to watch people get eaten by lions because clergy members, philosophers, and artists... Super Bowl! <laughs> ...have made us less tolerant of cruelty, not more tolerant. And this is my favorite part. He says, even, in, even the quest for justice can turn into barbarism if it is not infused with a quality of mercy, an awareness of human frailty, and a path to redemption. The crust of civilization is thinner than you think. Now, um... 
I'll just say two things before I throw it to you guys, but this reminds me of what Ruby Sales said when she came to Charlottesville. I think I've referenced it before. After August 12th, Ruby Sales, who's um, uh, the young, she's actually sort of a civil rights uh, activist from, she was a little girl when John Merrick Daniels, the Episcopal priest, shielded himself from her. She's a young black girl. And uh, she was sort of, her life was saved and she's become this incredible speaker and uh, activist. And she said that, make no mistake, that no, um, any way forward that doesn't allow for redemption Ooh. of the perpetrator is revenge, not uh, not reconciliation. And that was a very, very brave thing for her to say. But I also um, loved how he calls out, call out culture, for lack of a better term, for what it is, which is, um, it's a pleasure. There's there's a rush. We, we've talked about this with Tim Kreider. And if, uh, one guy on Facebook said that it's, it, it's a cruelty as a rush. Here it's, it's this sort of, they, they talk about it sexually, but it's usually perpetrated by those working out their psychological wounds, not to say that there's not any injustice at the heart of these things, but I thought he captured a, um, the brutal dynamic with which we are currently living. What did you guys think of it? So many thoughts. Uh, as you were talking, Dave, about mercy for the perpetrator and for the victim, it made me think of the church where you serve, you know, and the hard sermon that your rector had to give a few years ago in the midst of, I think, some kind of sports-based, you know, collegiate sex scandal, if I'm, rem if I'm remembering correctly. Am I remembering correctly, Dave? Um, you mean George Hughley, <laughs> when, when the, the, the lacrosse player... Uh... Yes. Yes. Murdered Yardley Love, or yeah. he, he murdered, yeah, where, he killed her. He definitely... Yeah, yeah. Where, where you're, that's right. So so that's what it was. But your um, Paul Walker, you know, amazed, t t talked about, I think you told me, I didn't listen to the sermon, but talked about mercy for, again, the perpetrator and the victim, which is a difficult thing to do in hard circumstances like that, but, um, and delicate. Um, but that's what we, what we believe in. Um, I actually went back and listened to that Invisibilia episode again, which is so good. And, and all due respect to David Brooks, the episode is way, way, way better than his, uh, than his article. And the thoughts which popped to my mind were, were number one, just how, how classic a story this is, you know, how it doesn't matter whether you're talking about, um, you know, first century Palestine or uh, a punk rock culture in Richmond, Virginia, that, that when you um, get a group of um, highly moralistic, uh, committed people, this is what's gonna happen. You know, that it just happens over and over and over again. And it, it makes me think of seculosity, you know, that even though the Richmond punk rock scene would never wanna think about themselves in religious terms, that's exactly what they were. And about how at first blush, it's incredibly attractive, you know, right? The, the host of the podcast says she spent time in this uh, world down in Richmond, Virginia. And every time she got back, she said to her husband, we've been living our life the wrong way because they were so committed to each other and to this ethic and they didn't care about the outside world. And they were just this little enclave um, unto themselves. Uh, but of course, what they end up doing is, is kind of uh, killing their own you know, in, in the way that, I don't know, like ISIS would, like not, like not really murdering, but socially ostracizing, you know, shoving to the outside. And it's just the same old story over and over and over and over again, when you get a little religious, tightly bound group, and then you have someone who um, perpetrates a sin and they're just, they're cast out. Um, which of course then made me think of the, the genius and beauty of kind of the Judeo-Christian idea of atonement. You know, that there needs to be atonement. There are always going to be things that have to be, that have to be atoned for. Um, so I thought about that. And then I thought about kind of this call out culture in general. And I thought about Jesus and I, I kind of realized that, you know, Jesus actually called everyone out. He called everyone out. You know, I think about the woman at the well, you know, yes, you are right that you are not married. You've been married five times and the man you're now with is not your husband. Or I think about, um, you know, the woman, uh, he says, you know, it's wrong to give uh, the children's food and give it to the dogs, <laughs> you know, or he's just constantly calling people a sinful and rebellious generation. Uh, he, he is calling out everybody. But then it's interesting because people have one of two reactions to that. Either one, they say they get very angry and they kill him, right? Because how dare you call us out, Jesus? Or they do what the woman at the well did, uh, come and meet this man who told me everything I ever did. 
you know, or that same woman, yes, Lord, uh, you know, but even the, the, the dogs um, pick up the crumbs under the table. They sort of, they, they, in some sense, accept the calling out and recognize their sinfulness. And when that happens, um, Jesus just like dispenses unlimited mercy, you know, unlimited grace. Uh, and so, I don't know, it was evocative for me on, on a lot of levels that it's, it's so awful to be called out. And yet I think that's what the law does, right? The work of the law is it calls us out, but then the work of the cross and of grace is to absolve and to heal and to proclaim mercy over that, which has been called out. And that's what there was just no room for at all in this punk rock, Richmond, Virginia culture. Um, mm. and so it was, uh, I, I, I listen to stories like that. I'm just like, how can this person not realize like the invisibility that they're, t that they're talking about religion? How, how can they not draw that connection? Cause it's just so obvious and you see it time and time and time again. Um, so I thought it was amazing, amazing, uh, piece of journalism, amazing episode and just true and sad and, and, uh, made me yearn for mercy and forgiveness. Yeah. I mean, I read this stuff and I'm, I think like most people are pretty terrified about what I have done in my past that could be pulled up at any mm -hmm. given moment. And so I think we should name that because I feel like a lot of people probably listen to this and feel like they're the only person that's done something dumb. Um, I don't know. I have a couple of different thoughts. RJ, when you were talking about Jesus um, calling people out, it also makes me think of like... Uh, the gospel of Luke and the two times that he weeps, right? Cause we, we talk about, you know, there's the famous Jesus wept that's in John, but in Luke, he weeps twice. He weeps at the death of, you know, Lazarus's funeral. And then he weeps a week before he goes to the cross when he looks out on Jerusalem and he's like, you know, basically like all of you who either heard it and didn't believe it or didn't hear it at all. And you know, who, who are going to be, um, lost in this and trapped in that, you know, talks about trapped in the city and, um, and being stoned. I mean, all this pr very like, uh, sort of language from the Psalms, very heavy, scary language. And yet when I think about this need to sit in front of a computer and tear one another down, um, it's actually pretty accurate. I mean, I think that is what is happening. You know, we are like picking each other's children up and like dashing their heads against stones on some mm. level when we do this. Um, also people aren't having enough sex and we see that over and over again in study after study, especially people who are like my age and younger are not having enough sex. They're not getting married till they're later. And then they're, but they're also just not having sex. And so any of those exchanges that we would have in intimacy where there's a real sense of acceptance and of love and of like, um, vulnerability about who we are, like people aren't having those anymore. And so what Brooks points to that I think is so insightful, this, this, this sentence, uh, um, zealotry is often fueled by people working out their psychological wounds. No one has, and I'm going to pull the word in here, a safe space uh, to do that anymore because people aren't getting married. People aren't in intimate relationships. People just have their screens. And so they're not... You know, I mean, in the in the in the bounds of marriage, there are those like or or in a committed relationship. But, you know, you have those moments where you, you know, you process hard things from childhood or you, you know, you cry together about stuff you've been through. Like people don't have that anymore. And it's going to come out one way or another. And what we get here is it coming out in this. I mean, it's very almost apocalyptic, right? These people are bound. Um, they are they're like closed into the city, you know, and, and it's like stone or be stoned kind of mentality. And they're destroying each other over. I mean, what Brooke said that really stayed with me is like that, that whole thing about there's no distinction between R Kelly and a high school girl sending a mean emoji. Like it's all up for grabs. Like if you ain't scared about what you've done, like you ain't remembering, you know what I mean? <laughs> like it's, yeah, it's crazy. There was also uh, this past week, and I had the lectionary was about the Jesus um, 
you know, being in Nazareth and saying these, he sort of puts down the Nazarenes by saying Mm -hmm. like, you know, you were, God came like Elisha went to the widow at Zarephath, you know, that I'm not actually here to grant you special status. And he sort of calls them out uh, for thinking that they're insiders and they, um, they react to that judgment. They react to that, um, to that, yeah, to that judgment by wanting to kill him. I mean, they, they yeah. go then they go and try and throw him off a cliff. Yeah, and uh, that is where people go when they're judged like this. Uh, of course, Jesus um, he passes through them, and this radical reversal happens again, and it happens in Jerusalem, and we all know where that ends. It happened it, with him sort of taking on the judgment of the world, yes. in this beautiful way, but. Um, I see this mob mentality working out. You know, I, I, gr- I grew up for a while. I was living in Germany when I was a kid. And um, I'm not going to talk about Nazis, the, but the, um, <laughs> the, it was very soon after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And we lived with a man who had been put in jail by the East German Stasi, by the secret police, because he essentially got called out for writing a letter that said too much in the West. And at that point, if you wanted to destroy someone's life, you could do it very, very, very easily. And it's not that we haven't always been vindictive and haven't always wanted our way and to sort of um, be righteous at the use it and find scapegoats, but to see it, to see that, uh, you know, uh, people being forced to act on this in a way and not see it as something that, you know, uh, we're all screwed up and there's got to be some way to distinguish between a mean emoji and R. Kelly. It reminds me of the fear that gripped that culture in which I was living. And if you watch, if people watch the lives of others, that amazing movie, then you, you see what we're talking about. It's not, it's not that long ago. So people make these jumps into history and you think, whoa, wait a second. That's, that's, we're talking about Richmond, Virginia in 2019. But, um, I don't know when people feel this judged, they want to kill the person who's judging them. And they also, uh, want to whitewash their own past in a way that allows for zero transparency or authenticity. And I think, Sarah, I think your point about the lack of intimate relationships is a fascinating one. Dave, what you said about when people feel this judge, they want to kill you, that is true, or they just fall on their knees and beg for mercy. You know, that, that the people that Jesus doesn't call out are the ones who've already been called out, like the woman caught in adultery. Like she's been called out and she knows she has no hope and he dispenses nothing but unlimited grace on her. And so I, I do think I, you're totally right. You know, the fruit of judgment, in the law is rebellion and anger. And, and, you know, we all are guilty of, of crucifying Jesus, you know? Um, but there is also a response of, of humility, you know, that Jesus talks about in the Beatitudes, like blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who, you know, hunger and thirst for righteousness. And, and also, you know, both of you guys mentioned what David Brooks said about there has to be some way to distinguish between, you know, the, the mean, emo, mean girl emoji and, and R. Kelly. But Jesus says no, that those are actually the same thing, right? Right. Like the, right? Bam. The, the, That's the, uncomfortable. <laughs> so it's uncomfortable. <laughs> right? you, you, you've Matthew heard it said five. that, you know, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that lust is the same. Don't keep, commit murder. Anger is the same. And I understand what you're saying because there's, a, there's an eternal component and a temporal component. Totally, yeah. But, but. what I loved about Emily in, and you, everyone go listen to the Invisibilia episode. Um, there's a little bit of uncomfortable kind of sex talk, but if you're a grown up, you can handle it. Um, Hopefully she you're having sex. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, but she, she doesn't, she's the one who gets called out for first, you know, she was a bully. She was a teenage female bully and she owns it all the way. She's like, you know, I didn't post that picture, but I was there and I, I was part of that conversation and I shamed that person. And to mm. her credit, she doesn't shy away from from her sin. She doesn't equivocate. She doesn't justify. She also has shown no mercy whatsoever. Um, but part of this is recognizing that for those, you know, the Pharisees' problem is that they thought there was a difference between the emoji and R. Kelly. And Jesus says, no, whitewashed tombs. No, 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 no. You're the same. And so the whole, everything's got to be leveled. It yeah. must, the, the playing field must be leveled under the law in order to be um, resurrected under the God, equally resurrected under the gospel. So again, I understand what he's saying, but you know, as Christians, especially 
being called out is what we are. Like that's what Jesus does. That's what the law does. And we need to be prepared to be called out. And when we're called out externally, internally, whatever, we just get on our knees. We're like, yeah, you're right. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so sorry. You're right. You know, I blew it. Please have mercy yeah. on me. Forgive me. And then we, you know, we're prepared to, you know, what is it? Uh, forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven others, <laughs> their trespasses, you know? So, all right, I'm done now. Yeah. No, good, it's, uh, it's beautiful. I think that that's our hope. I, uh, yeah, I mean, there's these, the things about seculosity, when we talk about secular religions, they're, they're like religions, they're like, uh, you know, uh, any other religion, uh, if it's a religion purely of law, there's just no grace, there's no, so it so it's becomes a dead end. And not only that, just sort of a vehicle of exhaustion and self-righteousness and... Right, but, which is like, I mean... Which is something we've talked about on here before. And I love, I do love what RJ is saying. And I think to the point about your book is like, there's actually no, when they, when we have these, when we have the conversations about me too, right. Or we talk about somebody like Louis CK, like the clear message we get from culture is he cannot be sorry enough. Yeah. I mean, that's mm. the message we get. Mm. Like we, there is, I mean, cause you see they'll, they'll have these conversations with, you know, sort of the talking heads, whoever, whatever academic or psychologist, whoever they've got on, you know, trying to process this. Well, what can they do? You know, that he showed up and he played at this club and you know, what can he do? And it's like, he can't do anything. He cannot do anything, but be cast into the outer darkness. That is the only way that we will feel better about him. Mm. And and um, that is some dark ass. I mean, that is dark, you know, and it's also why Christianity is super annoying because <laughs> we keep bringing that outer darkness like we keep pushing that light into the outer. You know what I mean? And it's it's just yeah. it's a it's a. I mean, I, I get why people don't want to be Christian. You know, it's a hard pill to swallow unless you've like dealt with, you know, and unle unless you have had those moments RJ talks about where you just fall to your knees and you're like, oh, this is it's the escape hatch in so many ways. Right. Like it's the yeah. it's the only escape hatch. Jesus be an escape hatch, you know. You know, there's also that anthropologist that they talk to, which David Brooks mentions about how social progress is made yes. through violence and through a group coalescing around a group of of norms and then basically just killing anyone who doesn't um, subscribe to those norms, you know, who says, I'm not going to play by your rules. And they're like, fine, we're just going to kill you. And how that's kind of, quote unquote, how things get better. But of course, as he was talking about that, I was like, OK, in Christianity, who is the one who doesn't conform to our norms and who um, tra transverses our moral and ethical boundaries and that we kill, it's Jesus. Like, let's remember, right. breaks the Sabbath, heals the people, loves the sinners, you know, that he becomes the, 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 the locust. Like, I, you know, not to compare uh, Jesus and Louis C.K. because that's ridiculous because Louis C.K., you know, is a sinner and Jesus it's isn't. a hot move, yeah. Yeah, and Jesus isn't, but this compulsion to cast someone into the outer darkness, either because of what they've done or because of the, the darkness that they represent that's in us. Jesus does that too. Mm -hmm. Like he becomes the, he like, he brings the light in by becoming the darkness. Yeah. Um, the scapegoat. And he is, he is the scapegoat. Exactly. Mm -hmm. He becomes the one who, uh, takes the penalty for, for everything. Um, so anyway, again, I listened to this episode. I'm like, how, how it just, it, it's so clear to me. Like how, how are you not, how are you not seeing these in religious terms? But I, anyway. I know, I agree. It's a wonderful episode. It's a, it's a great column. And it's funny how many people forwarded that to me, by the way, and folks that don't feel like they're allowed to like David Brooks or feel like that they're not allowed to sort of publicly say that this is right. Um, people from the left and from the right, especially people from the left who feel like they're not allowed to say it. But um, anyway, uh, speaking of scapegoats and uh, killing um, things to make ourselves feel better, or at, uh, atoned for, uh, we have Megan O'Geeblin, wonderful Megan O'Geeblin, who is interviewed and we published something of hers in our new Faith and Doubt issue of the magazine, which went out this week. She's got a new column in the Paris Review, and her first column is called uh, Objects of Despair, uh, Fake Meat. And anyone, um, at least where we are in Charlottesville, people keep talking about the Impossible Burger. 
which is this new sort of veggie burger that has blood in it, that they've put blood in it, and it tastes so much like a burger except for uh, there's no animal killed. And uh, this is what she writes about this current piece of cultural uh, interest. Um, she says, it is odd that we've invested so much ingenuity into putting blood into fake meat when the oldest Abrahamic religion has fixated for millennia on its removal. In addition to its painstaking lists of clean and unclean animals, the foremost prohibition in the Hebrew Bible, reiterated again and again, warns against eating meat that, quote, still has its lifeblood in it. The reason for that is stated by God himself in the book of Leviticus. Blood was to be reserved for ritual atonement. The animal's life was ransomed for your, for your own, and its blood could not be consumed like a common food. As barbaric as this ritual appears today, it did rely on a rigorous spiritual algebra. The rabbis understood that nature was a scrupulous accountant who could not be cheated. If you wanted transcendence, you had to pay the price. If not by abstention, then by finding a living thing to take your place. Today, it is not Christ, but science that declares all things clean. Most of us have by now come to dread its never-ending factory of miracles. Bacon conjured from tempeh and wheat gluten. Meat lovers pizza topped with soy sausage and cashew cheese. Ours is the dispensation of meatless buffalo wings and vegan Philly cheesesteaks. Early coverage of these products routinely declared them eerie, creepy, and a quote-unquote dark sorcery. Such derision reveals something more than aesthetic revulsion, something approaching spiritual unease. She goes on to say, for now, the sacrificial ethic persists in the language of quote-unquote substitution, which still appears on restaurant menus where meat analogs are accompanied by an upcharge of a dollar or two. In raw financial terms, the new and improved fake meats are still more expensive than the lives of animals. And perhaps it is this fact even more than the symbolism of blood that reminds us that absolution always comes at a cost. Every dispensation of grace demands its pound of flesh. This is like the best theology piece I've read in a it's long crazy. time. It's crazy. It's crazy. She so is good. such an incredible writer. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And I'm not even like, I'm not even really sure what it's about because it's kind right. of about everything at right. once, you know, and I just want to kind of I read it a few times and I want to read it about 10 more times and let it just wash over me. But the way that she just seamlessly intertwines, you know, ecology and theology and, and the Bible and... Um, Which is usually very poorly done for the oh record. Oh my God, it's You know incredible. what I mean? Very yeah. poorly done usually. Yeah, no. Yeah, this is remarkable. I mean, I what I love in this is there... <laughs> she doesn't really talk about us being self-righteous when we make these choices and yet it's so it's so evident right that this is like a thing we've all convinced ourselves we have to do it's a thing that we've put a tremendous amount i mean bill gates has helped to pay for this there's something about the sacrificial ethic i think which is um oh, stamped sure. stamped into the dna of uh meaning and purpose and, and the I, drive towards asceticism self-denial yes. these rules we create yes. i mean it's just i mean again to sorry to go back to the earlier article i'm just like there's no difference between some punk rocker deciding what foods to eat and getting all tatted up and and some devoutly Jewish person refraining from pork and wearing tassels. Like, it's the same thing, you know? <laughs> it's always the same thing and always the same consequences. It's nuts. Or some super fundy Christian being like, I'm drinking and smoking and, you know, I don't know. It's just crazy, man. Every so crazy. dispensation of grace demands its pound of flesh. This sort of uncomfortable uh, ah! truth. <laughs> but... Sorry, it's just so good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's this uncomfortable this truth that there's something... There's some sort of it's so true. What is it? What is it? Brene Brown talks about forgiveness. There's got to be some blood on the floor. We've yeah, talked there's got to be blood before. on the floor. But it's it's so true. When 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 we eschew any kind of any kind of accounting structure to the universe, we basically eschew uh, how. Uh, life operates whether we it, yeah. we, it may, we may not you can't want to yes. it away you don't yes. may you not argue want it, it to it may yes. it, maybe it shouldn't operate that way yes. but yeah. what she has done is she has unpacked because and you know Megan as she she talks about she's come she like went to uh, Moody Bible Institute she's and um, really she she understands these things from the inside out and her whole book Interior States and she's a person who's sort of lost her faith I think but is it it she talks about AA in really really uh, positive terms but she basically has sort of left the world of Moody Bible Institute, which is a really hardcore world, if you know it, and kind of gone out into the world and seeing, well, wait a second, I thought I was leaving this behind. And um, 
I find uh, myself right back in it. Maybe not in quite the same kind of uh, degree of shame, but getting close. And it's um, it's a great but also book. Also, not the same degree of absolution. Definitely, you know, probably no, zero, zero yeah. absolution. Yeah. yeah, unless yeah, unless I mean, it is kind of. I hate to like keep going back to the original article, but like <laughs> it does remind me, like that there isn't. Like this whole idea that a pound of flesh has to be taken is a hundred percent true, right? So when we have these people who we um, decide we're going to take that pound of flesh from to feel better about it, right? This is the exchange that happens, right? We're going to cast you. You are no longer a public figure. We are going to tear you down. That tweet you did in two thousand two, even though you're a stand up comedian, like you're not allowed to host the Oscars, for instance. <laughs> for instance, for for a hemplo. Theoretically, um, yeah. Yeah, but what we do in the, in that thing is that we actually we think we're taking a pound of flesh from Kevin Hart, for example, but really we're just taking it from ourselves. You know what I mean? Like cuz really like doing that to someone, particularly for something that they did like a decade ago, there's no way that you don't process that on some level as your own guilt, as your own psychological wounds, right? That you haven't dealt with, like as your own fear that you will be found out too, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it, she's so spot on theologically because flesh is going to be taken one way or another. And if you don't have a context for being Jesus's flesh, like good, good luck. luck, man. Yeah. Well, the, the, I think we should end on this wonderful last bit of, you know, in which another cost is clearly paid. And uh, the, here we have an incredible story of grace that you forward to us. It also happens to be about food and, uh, you know, people working out their salvation and experiencing the most important things in life through that. Um, and it's from Medium, actually, but it's called, I'm a little too fat, a little too giving. I think I know why by Christine Levine. And she talks about how when she was five years old, her mother sort of up and moved them to the coast. And I think it's Oregon, right, mm -hmm. uh, Sarah? It sounds like her mother was... Um uh, we, we don't really get the details on her split from the, her husband, but um, we get the sense she had a real serious drinking problem. And they move into one of these little, like seaside or close to sea, uh, motels in which you had your unit number one, unit number two, and they lived in unit number six. And it was not uh, a happy existence because they had really zero money, zero money. They moved to a place where they knew no one. And they talked about like the first day she, her mother puts, you know, pays for a month at this place and buys a sack of potatoes, which they proceed to eat the rest of the month. And it gets to a point where one night um, they're eating and they hear Walter, they're watching the TV in the room and Walter Cronkite comes on and talks about, here's the news at supper time. And they realize that they don't have supper that night. They, they're, they're out of food. And um, her mom contemplates possibly maybe stealing something, but says she's not a thief. And so what she does, uh, I'll read it to you here. Without another word, she passed me and walked out the front door of number six. That's where they were. She left it open and I followed her. She walked down five cottages and knocked on the door to number one, a larger cottage where an old man and woman lived. Even though they were our neighbors, we had no idea who they were. The old lady opened the door. This is my daughter, Christine, my mother stated. We have no food. She's had nothing to eat but potatoes for a month, and now we don't even have any of those left. I don't care about myself, but could you please give her something to eat? The old woman was short and fat with dark skin and black hair twisting around her head. Her name was Anita. Her husband was just called Van. I could see into their cottage. The table was set and Anita and Van were obviously just sitting down to eat. The smells coming from inside made me drool. I don't remember Anita saying anything to my mother or even asking her husband first if she could give us something, but I remember her packing up her table. The pot roast, the carrots, the gravy, the potatoes, she handed it all to my mother. It turned out that they had friends who owned one of the restaurants where my mom had tried to get a job. Anita talked to them and they hired her. Anita and Van became my caretakers uh, that evening. They saved my mother and me. At that moment, though, I don't think Anita and Van thought they were saving lives or forever changing the path of a child. I think they thought they were doing what they were supposed to do when a woman with a little girl comes to the door and says she needs to eat. What more needs to be said or done? They probably figured it was just food. 
Anita gave so effortlessly and so quickly that I doubt she ever thought about it again. And then she fast forwards to a time where her own daughter, uh, Christine's own daughter, is like trying to set up like a, a food pantry and is going through their cupboard and she's only taking the stuff that sort of they don't want to eat and keeping like the Kraft macaroni and cheese, but taking sort of the more, the less name brand things. And uh, she, but she sort of decides to sit her daughter down and she says, I told her that Anita could have just gone to her cupboard and made me a peanut butter sandwich. And my mother and I would have been so grateful, but she didn't. She gave the best she had. The biggest problem with poverty is the shame that comes with it. When you give the best you have to someone in need, it translates into something much deeper to the receiver. It means they are worthy. Giving the best you have does more than feed an empty belly. It feeds the soul. So good. I don't know. I just thought it was a, a beautiful instance of, um, uh, you know, uncoerced uh, grace to a person in need that is just, um, this has stuck with her. I mean, it's a living illustration of Luke 7 and those who've been loved, mu- you know, forgiven much, mm-hmm. loved much. And because mm-hmm. she's she is driven in the future, uh, not by willpower, but simply by heart to want to uh, feed people who need it. And yet this moment where she's given not just enough or she's not just given something, she's given everything. It's just over the top. And this kind of humble setting, uh, I don't know. I I found it to be profoundly moving and a beautiful instance of everything we've been trying to get at today. Uh, The Mm -hmm. the opposite of call out culture, Mm -hmm. you might say. Mm -hmm. She's where she's yeah. not. She's not said, "Oh, what's wrong with you? Why didn't you? Why can't you feed your daughter? Don't you clearly have a drinking problem? Uh, you, what is wrong? Your 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 avoidance by getting your avoiding your problems." Let me call problems. CPS. Let me call CPS. <laughs> right. It right. is. Uh, it's not. She's not called out. She is um, blessed, and she's imp- imputed to basically, but also. Uh, in an over the top way. I love how she says she packed up the whole all the table and just gave it to her. I don't know, Sarah. You, you sent it to me. What? What? Where? Where are you coming from on this? Uh, so, I read this piece. I thought of two things. The first thing I thought of was my my grandmother um, on my maternal side is one of seven and was born in 1920. So, I was a little girl during the Great Depression in rural Louisiana, which was no charming way to grow up. And she always told me about how many people would stop by their house to ask for food because everyone, you know, I remember asking her, like, were you poor? And she's like, well, everyone was poor. So we didn't really know what that meant, but we had enough. And but when people would stop by, that was such a normal practice Mm -hmm. that you would give them food. These strangers who would walk into your house. Um, And on some level, I think we can romanticize that stuff especially as people who've always had enough to eat i think it's very easy to kind of be like oh well you know and and we don't really do that anymore you know but the other thing i thought of is um i don't know if i've told you guys about this before so we have a feeding a program at my husband's church it's that national organization blessings in a backpack and they so they every friday kids get sent home with a bag and the, it's an amazing program because when we got there, we thought it was so cool because they fed 50 kids a week. And now we've been there six years and they feed like 1,400 kids a week, um, which is like the Holy Spirit. I mean, totally. But occasionally I'll have a Friday free and I'll go volunteer. And every time I do, I cry. I never know like what God is going to do. But every time I go, I cry. So the last time I went... I were like, you know, they're like, you uh, you go through the line and you pick up all these different kinds of foods. You put them in a plastic bag. There's all this kind of stuff. Like you only tie the bag once because these are little kids and they're so excited about their food. They'll rip into the bag if they can't get, you know, it's all this like stuff. And so I'm going through the line and all of a sudden I see this gigantic box of little things of queso. And I'm like, what the hell is this? Are we giving these kids queso? And I went over to the woman who ran the program and I'm like, what is this? And she goes, well... In the state of Texas, queso counts as a protein. And she said, and we thought they should have fun food too. And so these kids got chips. There was little bags of chips too. I mean, they're good little Texans. You know, they got chips and queso. And I thought about how many religious spaces I've been in that have fed people. And we lived in New York City, which if you want to be ground zero for religious rules about how to feed homeless people, oh my God, go to a church in New York. And how it was like, this isn't nutritious enough and we shouldn't, you know, I'll just, just so many, like, we're going to be in charge of them kind of stuff. 
And we're not just going to, you know, do that thing that, you know, that is so sacramental, which is just like the sacraments are ours to give away. The food is ours to give away. It's not ours to legislate. And I think that's, I mean, when you, Dave, when you talk about like, you know, it's like an over the top theology, right? That's what, when we talk about this grace, I mean, it is only an over the top theology that brings in the people cast into outer darkness. You know what I mean? And so when we, when we talk about that, like I can't help but think that there were 1400 kids that got chips and queso one weekend because it was a fun food, you know? To me, the most hopeful part of this article is when she says uh, how this woman bundled up the food so quickly and gave it to her so effortlessly that she probably doesn't even remember doing it. And that's so evocative to me of what Jesus says, you know, in the Sermon on the Mount, that when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that it should almost just be a thoughtless thing. Um, and that reminds me of what Karl Hall, the um, 1930s German theologian, said about Martin Luther and this amazing book, what is it, The Reconstruction of Morality? Is that what it is? Where he said, you know, yeah. what Luther said in contrast to the, the Catholic scholastics before him, the scholastics said that the moral weight of an action is equivalent to the effort it takes to, to do it. Like the harder something is, the more meritorious it is. And Luther said, no, no, it's the complete opposite. That the, the merit is probably uh, in proportion to how thoughtless it was. Because if you didn't think about doing it, then it was probably the Holy Spirit then it probably came from love and not from a desire to self-justify or be self-righteous or follow a rule or do the right thing, that it was just love. And the reason I find that, I really hope that that old woman doesn't remember. Mm. Because when I read an article like this, of course, I, f I feel very convicted, right? Because this was a moment that changed this little girl's now woman's life forever. It made her into who she is. It was a transformational moment. And I don't feel very generous, to be honest with you. I'm not good at giving my best. And I'm like, gosh, I just got to start giving my best more because when I give my best, it's going to change lives, you know? <laughs> but then, of course, I know that that's just not true. Because if, I, if my intention is to go out and do it for the wrong reasons or because I want to affect some change or make something happen, like, it is not going to happen. Like, my only hope is that God in his mercy by the power of his Holy Spirit will take me and do something through me that in his mercy I will not remember, but maybe somebody else will mm. because it'll be his work and not mine. Uh, and so that's my, <laughs> that's my prayer because um, I've had that experience where I've said to someone, gosh, when you did that thing for me, it meant so much, you know, when I've been trying to, and they'll, they'll look at me like, I have no, I have no recollection of what you're talking about. Yeah. I don't know if you guys have had that, that experience as well. So um, that's the hope for me, you know, that God actually does work through broken, sinful people like all of us to bring about hope and change, hope and change, uh, in people's lives. Golly. Thank you, RJ. I mean, I sort of keep hoping he'll use you too. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hope <laughs> brings it to keep praying. Keep praying, buddy. Um, Thank you guys both for uh, being here today. Just want to mention two things that um, we've just uh, finalized our last speaker, our mystery guest for the New York conference, and that's going to be Leslie Jameson, who wrote The Recovering, and she is an unbelievable essayist um, and um, uh, writer in New York. And also we, or our registration for Tyler, for our event in Tyler, April 5th and 6th opens. Um, it's open now. And Sarah and I will both be there. And Steve Brown is uh, Steve uh, the, Brown's the venerable be there, Steve Brown, who's got a much better Three free sins, baby. Ra radio voice than any of us. I'm except for so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so because I stole happening. his prayer, you know, like I totally stole his prayer. You got to do it. You got to do it in front of now him. Now I'm going to do it in front of him. <laughs> it's going to happen. Have you met him before? No, met... I was on his he's show. Awesome. He's, he's so, such a good guy. Yeah, he's yeah. awesome. Well, we're going to anyway, be, yes. that's two things going on in April. And Salty. the faith and doubt issue is out. And we're just grateful to all of you uh, for listening. Talk to you again in a few weeks. Bye. Later. Bye. Thank you for listening. Remember, you can find us on the web at www.mbird.com. 
And we'd always love to hear from you at info at mbird.com. Audio production for The Mockingcast is provided by the Narrativo Group. And if you like what you've heard, please do drop over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. Until next time. Praise the Lord.